Um, today is the 18th annual World Day Against the Death Penalty, first organized in 2003 by the uh, World Coalition Against the Death Penalty. And I am so pleased that we are joined today by Senator uh, Patty Panzing Brooks from uh, the Nebraska State Legislature, uh, District 28, right here in Lincoln. Um, we have Megan and John A. from the uh, Racial Justice Coalition of Nebraska. Thank you for waving. And we have uh, Christy Hargesheimer, um, a longtime abolitionist, activist, and just all around wonderful person, joining us on behalf of, yeah, I, I get to say that, uh, joining us on behalf of Amnesty International. Um, and we have a couple other people on the call. And I would welcome Margaret and Jean and uh, Mary. Thank you for showing up. And um, just briefly, my name is Alex. I'm the development coordinator for Nebraskans for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. Um, I'm kind of new at this. I don't have any moderator training, but uh, to, to mangle an old saying, I would say he who moderates least moderates best. So um, I'm hoping to lead off with a couple of introductory comments uh, and then I'm hoping that our um, conversation sort of develops organically um, uh, rather than just a structured series of questions and answers. Um, just just a, a brief bit of housekeeping. This, this, uh, this meeting is being recorded for future usage. So if you're watching this in the future, hello from the past. Um, we are currently Facebook Live on the NEDP Facebook page. Um, Near the end, as we as we seek to wrap things up, we will give a brief overview of how viewers and supporters can further engage with the people and the organizations represented here. Um, audience participants on the Zoom call should feel free to ask questions in the chat. I can't I can't guarantee we'll get to all of them, but um, we'll do our best. And finally, we've scheduled this event for about an hour, so for the panelists that need to jump off at three, that's totally cool. But like I said a bit ago, I don't have anything else going on today, so if if we're still going, I'll keep the meeting open. I don't care. Um, it's, it's a beautiful day. Um, first, uh, a brief word about the World Day Against the Death Penalty. We are observing this day with people around the world. And it's a little bit overwhelming to think about um, how many people are, uh, are thinking about this, this, this issue today. And um, I would point out that uh, the NADP and the World Coalition are nonpartisan organizations, as I'm sure uh, Racial Justice Coalition and Amnesty are as well. Um, and that's important because we need to welcome everybody. Um, to, to borrow a phrase from my friend Monty earlier today, um, we need everybody to solve this problem. Um, and that's important as well because opposition to capital punishment arises from just about every point across the political spectrum. In fact, our, uh, our own Nebraska Unicameral's successful attempt to abolish the death penalty in 2015, um, I'm, I'm looking at one of the yes votes right now, uh, could not have been possible without a broad coalition of Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and Libertarians. So I, if, you're, if you're here on the call, if you're, if you're listening, um, if you're watching on Facebook Live, I would welcome you all, um, whether you're a panelist or an observer, because Think about this for a second. You are adding your voice to the, uh, the growing global chorus of people who agree that capital punishment is bad public policy, whether that's because it violates the tenets of your faith, uh, whether you think it's savage and brutal, whether you think it's a total failure as a crime deterrent, whether you think no government should have that kind of power over other humans, whether you think society as a whole uh, is better served by restorative justice and punitive justice, um, whether you feel it violates the tenets of your faith, I think I said that one already. Um, whether you think it's wasteful and expensive, whether you think it's applied unevenly to people of different socioeconomic and de uh, demographic backgrounds, whether you think the risk of executing an innocent person is too great, whether you think it's government overreach, whether you think it's wielded as a political weapon, whether you just don't like it, or finally, whether your conclusions in include any or all of these reasons. You're here because you believe that our global society would be safer and healthier without capital punishment. And I thank you deeply for your participation. Um, and finally, each year, uh, the World Day has a specific focus. In the past, that focus has been on topics such as conditions of prisons, um, 
use of death penalty as punishment for drug crimes or uh, terrorism, and the effects of poverty on its, uh, the frequency of its, of its use. Um, this year, the focus is on ensuring, protecting, and expanding the constitutional right to effective legal representation at every stage of the justice system. We'll talk a little bit more about that soon, but first I want to introduce all of our panelists. Um, I think we should probably start with uh, Senator Patty Penzing Brooks. Um, if you would like, uh, please take a moment to share a little bit about your own personal convictions, what led you to this uh, conclusion and this fight. And then I would invite you to talk about legislative actions you've taken um, and hopefully some that you plan to take. Uh, so I will ask, I think, yeah, yep, there we go. Okay, thank you, Alex. I appreciate being here and I'm so grateful for uh, to be part of this panel. Um, I probably one of the most moving and memorable and uh, I don't know, life altering uh, times in, in my stint in the legislature and in Nebraska, we have two four year terms. And so, uh, as Alex said, we, uh, we banned the death penalty in 2015. Uh, Senator Chambers had been uh, working on this for decades and he led the entire effort. And uh, it, was, it was truly, uh, an experience just that felt like we were on the right side of everything at that point. It, we had such hope, we had such joy at, um, you know, making sure that that we are not imposing the gravest act uh, that the state can that the state could do, killing another person. That that was no longer allowed. It was it was truly a moving and exciting moment. It was exciting to watch Senator Chambers, who'd worked on it for over four decades, and uh, just just to be part of that whole uh, movement, which then went worldwide. They even lit up the Coliseum, as many of you remember at that point. It was truly um, a historic and memorable uh, moment. Uh, then, of course, that was followed up by the initiative petition in Nebraska, which uh, was was headed by our governor, Governor Ricketts, and um, and his father. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on that uh, initiative effort to put it on the ballot and then uh, to have a campaign to show how terrible people can be and how we should be killing them as a state. So that's, a, that's my summary of it. I'm sure others would have a different summary, but um, that, that, that initiative petition uh, did pass and we now have the death penalty again. And uh, I think it's probably, you know, one of the, one of the saddest uh, whole events or journeys that I have uh, watched from beginning to end. So anyway, I, um, we, again, that effort has continued in the legislature and, um, you know, Senator Chambers is gone. So it will be up to others of us to continue to um, bring that issue before the body. And uh, I know that there will be some of us that do that. We haven't decided who's going to do it yet, but uh, I am certainly willing. Um, I had a bill this year that uh, dealt with uh, execution transparency and uh, because uh, in the, the last uh, execution that we had uh, they put up a curtain for 11 minutes during the 11 most critical mo uh, moments of or minutes the 11 most critical minutes of the execution and uh, the press who are required by statute to be there were unable to see what happened as were the other witnesses that were there um, again allowed by by state statute. So uh, my bill LB 238 this year basically said you can't put up a curtain anymore. Um, if, if the government is going to do this most solemn of acts, the killing of another human being, uh, then it should there should be complete transparency and it should be able to be witnessed by those with that authority under state law. Uh, rather than putting up the curtain. And again, I, I likened it to the Wizard of Oz, please pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Well, uh, you know, the theory that we are the government, trust us, is not sufficient in this case. And I feel adamantly about this. Uh, it did pass on uh, 
We passed it in the legislature, um, and then our governor vetoed that bill. So, um, and I, I have the feeling it was coming because I had a lot more votes on general and select file. Every bill goes through three votes, and the bill, the, the vote started waning by the time uh, it got to final read. And it was pretty clear to me that uh, a that a veto was coming. And we had uh, our and another thing that was aggravating is that our speaker had set up the um, the legislative agenda and calendar so that we were not able to come back and override that veto because there were not sufficient days remaining to do that. So. Um, I, um, it, that part's been frustrating. I, I've, I've done a lot of other things uh, on right to counsel for juveniles and, and other matters, which I'm happy to talk about, but I'll let uh, other people speak and then get back to those things maybe. Thank you. Um, and just real briefly, I, my, my regular job, is, I spend all day at a computer. So one of the things I like to do is, is I listen to a live stream of the floor debate in my headphones while I'm, while I'm working away. And I specifically remember you getting into it with other senators, I won't mention who, uh, about uh, juvenile right to counsel and they did not seem to appreciate it. And I, you know, I- No, it's- it's truly been my my um, probably the thing that I've been most passionate about during during my time in the legislature because um, 53 years ago the Supreme Court said that the condition of being a boy does not justify a kangaroo court and it said at that point children have specific vulnerabilities and we need to be making sure that they have counsel. And I've talked to judges across the state. I talked to one in particular in a, st in a community where, uh, let's see, 72% of the children in the public schools are Hispanic. And he said to me, don't worry, we take care of our own. And I said, well, in, a, in an area where 72% of the kids in the public schools are Hispanic, which are your own? And, you know, it's, it's, it's very worrisome to me because so many kids are getting into the system without representation. And of course, we know that if a child goes into the juvenile justice system, that they're most likely to go on into the criminal uh, and adult system. So uh, it is something that is um, terrible. It, we did pass a law that, that requires Lincoln and Omaha, the two largest uh, cities in Nebraska, to provide immediate counsel for children, and that is happening, but there are places across the state where that is not happening, and we have justice by geography for children, and it's, it is unfathomable to me as a lawyer. Uh, I, am, I am shocked and dismayed, and uh, it's one of the things that, that just burns in my heart right now. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, to my mind, uh, there seems to be almost a pretty bright line between um, the thought of, hey, trust us, we're the government when it comes to something like the death penalty and, you know, kids don't need uh, representation because they have exactly. parents and, you know, not every exactly. parent is an effective uh, source of legal counsel. In fact, I know I wouldn't be. Well, I, I don't think any one of us, I, I, I never recommend that anybody would go into the into a system, uh, the justice system without a lawyer. And it's not just because I'm a lawyer. I would never go, and if I were charged with something, I would never go without a lawyer. I don't practice criminal defense or you know any of that area. So there is no way that any of us should be going in without a lawyer. It's complicated, it's a different language. People go to law school and learn this different language exactly because it is so difficult. And then to ask a child, uh, when, the, when the fourth graders come through the Capitol, I always ask them, do you know what, what right to counsel is? Do you know what a counsel is or an attorney? And they, they just look at me and, you know, some of them might have known an attorney from something on TV, but they have no idea about their rights. They have no idea, you know, so I just tell everybody, every child I see, tell your friends, tell everybody, you should get a lawyer, always get a lawyer if you ever get into trouble with the system. So, and, and, and people don't like that. It's, it's ridiculous. It is just, it's unconstitutional. Um, the, the judges know it's unconstitutional and uh, I will continue fighting for the next two years on this, so. 
that I'm in the legislature. Should I, should I, should I take that to mean that uh, we haven't seen the last of LB 238? Uh, that's that's true too. I'll be 230 on, on execution transparency. It just makes no sense that, I mean, again, we are a nonpartisan legislature, which is how I got people voting across the aisle on this on this bill. And uh, to say that we are going to put up a curtain and and say that that the state or those who are identified as key witnesses to the execution shouldn't be able to view the whole thing. We've never done that before. And so for that bill to have been vetoed, what is it that they're hiding? What is going on behind that curtain? Uh, the fact that they don't want us to see it is because we've, and we've seen in states around the country that there are botched executions. So the fact that they don't want us to see that botched execution isn't just because they don't want us to see it or be uncomfortable with the fact that somebody is being put to death but it's because the execution may be botched. And uh, I just, it, it's shocking to me. We've never done that before in our state. What is the reason? What is the point? And um, when you look at the 14 minutes prior to um, the 11 minutes when they put up the curtain, uh, it's clear some things were going on. There was some gasping, some turning blue. Um, so something was definitely going on, but we we can't, uh, know what it is. And, you know, when I think of my more conservative colleagues, uh, their hue and cry in the past has always been about transparency and transparent government, uh, the watchfulness of the citizenry. Um, so if we, if we are not watching the most grave and solemn act of the state, then we are not, we are not fulfilling our role. And this is not some sort of, uh, you know, fascist government hopefully, um, that, you know, can, can move forward and do whatever they want and forget what, the, what uh, the citizens are supposed to be doing, which is watching the acts of government, that, it be, that those acts be legal and appropriate and constitutional. Absolutely. I agree 100 percent, and I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you've become a champion of this. Um, Thank I, you. My only regret is that I no longer live in your district. <laughs> <laughs> I regret that too, Alex. But the nice thing is um, I, I now live in uh, number 27, which has an election in, in a few weeks. So, Yes, uh, and that's a great one. Yeah. Um, also, I'm going to take a brief moment to shout out the previous uh, holder of District 27, uh, Senator Koash, was hugely instrumental in, in getting the repeal passed in 2015 as a conservative. I, I don't know if it would have happened without him. And I can't imagine he's watching right now, but uh, if he someday happens to see this, I would thank him directly as well. Um, uh, with that, I- He, he like, was amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, with that, I would like to, um, introduce our next couple of, uh, of, of speakers. We have the founder and executive director of the Racial Justice Coalition, uh, Megan, is on the call. Um, and uh, we have the policy director, uh, Johnny, is also on the call. So um, if you'll give me just a moment, I think I need to unmute you both, maybe. There we go, okay. Um, would love to hear from both of you. Um, go ahead and, and share a little bit about your own uh, convictions, what led you into this work, and then uh, tell us all about your um, relatively new, as I understand it, organization. Um, floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so yes, we're an extremely new organization. So I, I know a lot of other folks on the call are probably like, what, you know, what's the Racial Justice Coalition? Um, we are a coalition that actually operates in multiple states right now. Uh, we are in Nebraska and in Texas. So um, a lot of our work is centered around the Racial Justice Act that you referred to earlier, Alex, um, coming out of North Carolina. And so the goals of our coalitions are essentially to collect data, uh, you know, on how the death penalty is applied disproportionately uh, to folks of color 
as well as you know general sentencing, how there are racial disparities in, in sentencing among general felonies. Um, and then we hope that, that, that those statistics provide a basis for legislation that opens the door for those statistics to be used in appeals. So in Texas, we're bringing a Racial Justice Act that looks a lot like the North Carolina Racial Justice Act, which basically allows defendants to um, appeal their, their, their capital punishment as sentencing if they can show that racial bias was a substantial factor in the outcome of, of a jury deciding to give them the death penalty. In Texas, we don't have any type of three-person, a uh, three-judge panel review. It's solely a jury decision. Um, and so essentially, we have already submitted a, a draft bill to the Texas legislature, um, and we anticipate bipartisan support with the Texas Racial Justice Act, which is insane. Um, we've been able to work with Rodney Reed's family, if y'all are familiar with his case, um, we have a lot of wrongful convictions coming out of Texas because the death penalty is so prolific. Um, and so that's, you know, part of the work that we do um, is, is working on things like that. There's a ton of data available to us. People have been working on this issue for a very long time. And we see that, you know, not only do prosecutors choose to pursue the death penalty at a disproportionately high rate when the defendant is black, um, but also we see that the jury selection process is greatly, um, you know, engineered to the disadvantage of black defendants. So we are excited about that. Um, but being that I am from Nebraska, uh, our policy director, John A. is from Nebraska, we thought, you know, let's take this home. Let's do some work in Nebraska because we believe in Nebraska's just, we think that Nebraska is a great state to do a lot of cool new legislation. We often predicate a lot of our work on the fact that there was a death penalty uh, abolishment at some point and folks are really shocked to hear that and so we think Nebraska is a great place to do this. Um, unfortunately, Nebraska doesn't have a lot of data uh, to, to look at kind of disparities in sentencing and so that's one of our projects now. Um, is, is collecting that type of data and looking at disparities in sentencing. So I'll let John A, she's our policy director, talk about um, our work in Nebraska as well as what we are looking at legislatively for Nebraska. Yes. So I am interested in this kind of stuff mainly because I do have a criminal justice background. That was my bachelor's degree in undergrad. And it's prevalent definitely in Nebraska, the disproportionate sentencing and um, convictions of minority defendants here, which also uh, surprises a lot of people. I currently live in California and they don't realize how segregated um, Omaha specifically and the rest of Nebraska is. And that definitely has a problem in the criminal justice system specifically. I think our focus is going to be jury selection because even having one minority defendant can reduce the chance of conviction quite significantly. And it's important for us to bring everything together and make sure that the justice system is fair for all because the way it is now is just not okay. So with our Racial Justice Act in the Act in Nebraska, there aren't a lot of individuals on death row here. Um, so we're expanding it to felony convictions as well, um, where they would be able to convict or to overturn um, potentially if they can prove the racial bias. You did mention the Racial Justice Act in California, which was just recently passed and signed by Gover Governor Newsom. Um, so their act there, they actually have a task force to conduct studies, which I think is really important because with the lack of studies, it makes it easy for people to just sweep racial disparities um, under the rug. So if when we're able to put this stuff in their face, saying like you can't ignore it anymore, like they really don't have an option to just kind of turn a blind eye and act like it's not real. Um, but ours is also very close to the, in Nebraska, the California one, which prohibits the use of race and ethnicity and national origin to seek or obtain convictions. Um, I know they had some issues with prosecutors mainly um, because it's, it's essentially kind of a prosecutor check, even though that's not our, that's not our purpose, but that's kind of what it is. And 
obviously like I as a prosecutor I wouldn't necessarily like that but I think it's important to benefit our justice system as a whole especially in today's um, climate it's very prominent it's very well known like people are taking notice to this and I think this is the perfect time for these types of discussions so people can become more aware and more educated about what's going on <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for, for going through that. Um, I have read studies and I couldn't begin to tell you where that say that uh, most people would rather lose a game they see as refereed fairly than, than win one that wasn't. And um, I totally agree. Um, increasing the integrity of our justice system uh, from start to finish, um, specifically when it comes to treating uh, different segments of our, of our population differently um, will increase everyone's uh, trust in that system just across the board. And um, until we until we have that, um, there's not there's not a lot of firm ground we can really build other types of reform on. I think. Um, uh, and and just to circle back on the, on the North Carolina um, Racial Justice Act. Uh, the big news earlier this summer was that the North Carolina Supreme Court ruled that the process of challenging sentences that began before the law was repealed would be allowed to continue. And I think it was just within the last two weeks, maybe, um, that three people who were on North Carolina's death row had their sentences commuted as, as a result of a successful uh, Racial Justice Act challenge. Um, to their original sentencing. So it's, it, it's already working. It's, it's pulling people off of death row. It's exposing racial bias uh, throughout the justice system. And, and again, as you sort of mentioned, this has been uh, a huge focus um, this year um, with a lot of what's going on, um, you know, with regard to different people's experiences with uh, every step of our justice system along the way. And this is, you know, kudos to the World Coalition for picking such a, a, a timely um, focus. Uh, yeah, definitely. And we actually do work with the folks in North Carolina. Um, David Weiss, um, he represented Marcus Robinson, who was the first case to win an RJA appeal. And um, we recently did an interview with the executive director of the Center for Death Penalty Litigation in North Carolina, and they do all of the Racial Justice Act appeals. Um, and that's up on our YouTube, but we were able to talk them through kind of how they, because a lot of them were instrumental in the actual passage of the legislation. And really all of these appeals are coming down based on one study out of Michigan State, uh, their law school. And so that's kind of where we get our inspiration to run studies is we're like, if we can find any type of data points, any type of cooperation from public offices, which we've been able to get some cooperation there, um, then we can make real change based on something that people perceive as boring, such as statistical data. <laughs> so that's something we're really excited about. Yeah, and, and I'm sure Senator Pans and Brooks will, will agree. I, I mean, I don't want to speak for it, but um, being able to approach uh, legislators with a stack of empirical data um, goes such a long way towards um, building the political will and the political cover to um, to reach for for bold reforms. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, that you've chosen your home state to. Uh, to focus on some of this and, and to, to collect data and, and build that sort of research. Um, I think uh, it's gonna form a really strong foundation for reform efforts in the future. So I'm glad you're doing this work. Um, and, and I'm, I'm I am, glad. I am too. <laughs> I am too, and I agree that the statistical data is really important for uh, other, other legislators. And um, I did write a Jenea message that Voices for Children does a lot of this data on uh, children on overrepresentation of kids of color uh, in, in the juvenile area, but also I think the Ombudsman's Office has some of this information too, so you might try to contact them to, I'm not sure it's gathered appropriately, so okay. it will be really good for you. Both Any suggestions are helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's fabulous. Well, Thank you. 
I do have one further question for both of you. Um, as, as you're sort of building this momentum, is there, is there anything you specifically need from people who support your mission? Like, are we talking like volunteerism? Um, like say, say I'm, a, I'm a random person who hears about the Racial Justice Coalition and I would like to get involved. What can I do to help further your mission as, as just a regular person? Of course, I think a lot of it, and I'll go first, Johnny, I'm sure you have suggestions as well. Um, a lot of it is uh, circulating information about really what we know to be unfair in the criminal justice system right now. We do put out a lot of uh, articles and stories about folks. We're having trouble um, collecting cases in Nebraska. Uh, so, you know, any kind of crowdsourcing of information about cases that this could apply to um, is important. We've been talking to Ernest Jackson's family and collecting information about his case. Um, but I, I think a lot of people, when they hear about this, they assume, well, um, is this like affirmative action for, um, you know, people in the system? Or um, if we have constitutional, if we have a constitution and you have constitutional rights, why would you need an appeal like this? And I, I think painting that clear picture of constitutional barriers are so high, the thresholds are so hard to meet. And what we're doing is we're creating a, a bigger basis for people to really plead those constitutional violations. And so um, I think the biggest thing would be sharing our information, sharing uh, information about the disparities. And hopefully, uh, once we're able to publish those studies, distributing those. Um, because that's the biggest thing. I think people need a clear idea in their head what this actually means. Um, instead of maybe people leaning into a more partisan view of things, because we are a nonpartisan organization, like you said before. Yeah, and I just think um, even if, I mean, we always accept volunteers. We have a volunteer mm -hmm. form on our website. Um, just anything helps. Even if you're just someone who has experienced injustice or has a, know someone who has experienced injustice, could really help us be able to uh, put a face with the cause um, and to explain to people how this may help and um, give us more, I don't know, more structure and more evidence of that this actually happens in Nebraska because statistics are so low here and with statistics you have stories are so low. Like if it's not on the news, you're not going to hear about it basically here and that's where we've seen that we've struggled here um, with finding people that we know this could help because we know they're out there we just haven't been able to find them yet sure it, it takes time to sort of uncover all that you know because it's it's not always newsworthy unfortunately um yeah and my i think my final direct question for the two of you uh how close are we to draft legislation in the unicameral um, so basically, to be frank, John, John A and I just came off of our bar exams on Monday and Tuesday. Um, so <laughs> you've been asleep since then. <laughs> so I think, yeah, so we have been really putting together a lot of been focused on the data side of things because we're worried about um, not having a sufficient basis. But we do have a fact sheet that's on our website. And so we were hoping to start reaching out and really having that more legislative push rounding the corner of the bar exam. So um, now that we kind of have our policy together, I think that's our next step. Um, yeah. We have spoken to uh, some folks about it, but we haven't really been full force yet. That's actually our next step. Uh, so we've, we've got our, our fact sheet together. We have our, we have a data team actually, they're all volunteer data analysts. Wow. And so, that took a lot of work. Trying to pull data from out of people's hands, that's a lot of work. So, <laughs> um, so our next step is really doing, you know, doing the legislative push. Yeah, we have been in talks with, you know, some senators just to see how they feel about it, what they think about the legislation. Um, but the legislative session had just recently closed, and then they were pushing for the special session. So their hands were full and they were all busy. So we're hoping with kind of this 
lull time, a break between sessions, we can fully get a push going for the legislation to get grabbed by someone. Awesome. Well, fingers crossed. Um, I would be happy to marshal some some people to testify in legislative committee hearings. I, I, I enjoy doing that. I don't think most people probably do, but I always end up real sweaty afterwards, but it's always worth it. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we, we could use all the help, so. <laughs> great, great. Then I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you're here for that reason too. Um, I'm, I'm excited to, you know, sort of boost your platform as well. Um, if, if, if that's something we can, we can help in, um, we, we certainly would love to. Um, finally, I, I don't want anyone to think I've been ignoring her, but uh, Christy herself asked if she could go last. So uh, as, as uh, I, I don't want to, oops, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to uh, speak for her, but uh, as I understand it, she's here as a representative of Amnesty International. Am I? Right. Well, okay. I'm the uh, state death penalty abolition coordinator for Nebraska on behalf of Amnesty and I, and I've been um, picking the brains of a lot of my colleagues in Amnesty. And uh, I just wanted to uh, mention something. I, I'm so happy to meet Megan and Jane, um, and especially to find out you're working in Texas as well, because um, Roderick Reed was just on an Amnesty panel last week, and one of the things he said that I really liked was, without capital, you get the punishment. And he was so poorly represented by his lawyer that it's just, you know, it's dismal what's going on in Texas. And my friend um, in Texas, who's my, my colleague on the SD PAC, uh, Rick now I'm blanking on his last Halprin. name. Halprin, thank you, my, my assistant is here. Rick Halprin um, sent me some information in my request about things going on in Texas with representation that is really shabby. Um, in 2003, there was an attorney who kept falling asleep during the trial and they um, ruled at the time that, let me see if I can find this, um, the panel of the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that a defendant in a capital mur murder trial does not have an absolute constitutional right to have an attorney who stays awake for the entire trial. That was in 2003. And then, um, by the way, the governor at the time was George W. Bush, and he was asked about sleeping lawyers during a debate and he defended the state's procedures. Fast forward to April, 2019, just a little over a year ago. And uh, there was a case where a habeas petition was filed on behalf of a death row inmate whose primary lawyer snoozed throughout the trial. And uh, because he was seen sleeping, they appointed a an assistant attorney, and then they said, well, he did have some re representation, so it doesn't matter. So there you go. Um, I, I do have a question for you. Does yeah. Rick Halp is, is Rick Halperin related to Randy Halperin? I don't know. Who's, who's, he's, he's a defendant on death row, Randy Halperin. He's, we're actually looking at his case. Uh, yeah, I, I've heard of Brandy Helper, and, and I don't think he is related. Rick teaches at the university in, I forget which university in Texas, and he was a former board chair of Amnesty International USA. Um, really, his, his life, I feel really bad for him because he has to deal with some horrendous stuff in Texas. And we have a lot to learn from some of these other states. Um, Maine, for example, is, this is just from this week, um, is the only state in the country that doesn't have a public defender system. And so legal services for the poor are left to private attorneys. And some of them have been disbarred uh, for things like, oh, child pornography and, and murder, and then they've served their sentence or whatever, and they're back. And then they get appointed 
to indigent uh, uh, people who can't afford an attorney. So, you know, that's not good. Um, we do a lot better in Nebraska, obviously. But um, in 2018, I believe, Nebraska, uh, the legislature had a study. Um, oh, I want to back up and make sure that you all know about uh, David Baldus's study that was from 1973 to 1999 in Nebraska, and some of the findings were that we do have a disproportionate number of um, people of color who get the death penalty, especially if the victim is white. If the victim is a person of color, you know, they, they might serve a sentence and then get out. Um, and so, uh, you know, we the other thing that they found was that it's, that's disproportionate as to in which county a trial is taking place. Some counties don't have the financial resources to um, adequately prosecute, and so they tend not to do a death penalty case because they are much more expensive. Um, and that's something that people don't understand, that the death penalty and is so much more expensive than than having somebody in prison for life or for a certain term. So um, I wanted to, the reason I wanted to go last was because I didn't want to talk about things that other people were talking about, but that study that the Judiciary Committee uh, ordered in 2018, it was an interim study to examine the adoption of the ABA guidelines uh, for the appointment and performance of defense counsel in death penalty cases in Nebraska. And I don't know if any action was taken after that. Maybe Senator Penzing Brooks knows what happened after that study. Um, and she is in my district, so I'm very happy <laughs> about that. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up was that, well, just talking about Nebraska here, this is, this year, December 20th, is the 100 year anniversary of the first use of the electric chair in Nebraska. And incidentally, in 1920, there was also a mass meeting of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in Omaha they were looking to start a movement to abolish the death penalty in Nebraska. That was 100 years ago this year. And um, they, they didn't succeed, obviously, but, but, um, but uh, these efforts have been going on for a long time. The execution in um, 1920 was uh, one of the gentlemen, two men were executed on that same day. Alan V. Grammer was one, his victim was Lulu Vogt, V-O-G-T, who was his mother-in-law. And he got a friend of his to go with him and, and kill his mother-in-law. The great-granddaughter of Lulu now stands in front of the governor's mansion with me and a few other people every Monday at noon. And you're all welcome to join us. The granddaughter, great granddaughter of that murder victim is there with us to protest the death penalty. And I think that's pretty amazing. So uh, looking internationally, um, there are 143 countries that are either abolitionist, that's like two thirds of the countries in the world, abolitionist or not practicing right now uh, executions. Last year, there were 20 countries that had executions. Um, we, were, we were in the company of people like, you know, China, Iran, Iraq, Egypt, um, Saudi Arabia, a lot of, a lot of people that, that we really um, want to emulate, I guess. And we would not be able to be in the European Union if we were in Europe, we would not be allowed into the European Union because they won't allow people or countries to join that are 
not abolitionist. So those are just a few comments that I wanted to do. Um, somebody has said, what do you do if you're on a jury, you're, you're being asked to be on a jury and you're going through that little interview and you say, well, I'm anti-death penalty. Instead, what you can do is say, um, you know, I'm willing, if the prosecutor can persuade me that it's appropriate, I will listen to what the prosecutor says. And you can get seated. I am too well known as an abolitionist that they would never seat me. Um, I'm going to tell a couple of little quick stories. One is that uh, when my husband Richard proposed to me, I've always intuitively been opposed to the death penalty. I don't know what triggered it, but when he proposed to me, I paused and I looked him in the eye and I said, well, what's your stand on the death penalty? <laughs> and we're married, so obviously he answered correctly. Then we became both members of the board of NADP and somebody mentioned that we're not a political, we don't have parties and so forth. Um, both at former uh, governors, Robert Crosby and Frank Morrison served together on that board. And I just think that was, that was a thrill to be in their company. Um, so anyway, there's a link that I put up uh, in the chat that shows the history. It's an uh, NPR 57 minute program with the history of the death penalty in Nebraska. And that might be kind of fun for some of you to look at. Can't think of anything else. I know I've left out a lot, but I don't want to take up too much time if there are questions. Um, speaking of the chat and, and Chrissy, I don't I don't see the link. Didn't yet. I don't see it yet. I'll just say it. But, okay, let me look. Um, speaking of the chat, in the meantime, um, one of our participants, Mary, was was telling us in the chat about um, an upcoming Judiciary Committee hearing on October 22nd, which will be examining issues related to, uh, oop. There it is. I yep, had there it is, got it. Uh, she says examining issues uh, related to Nebraska's correctional system and to examine the Nebraska parole and pardons processes. Um, Senator Penzing Books can probably provide more information, and she did. Um, it says, uh, I yep, can, let me ahead. just, I, I found it. So it's on the 22nd, that's correct, at 9 a.m. Um, it's it's in room 1525, so but it will also be live streamed. So uh, I hope it's not a packed uh, room, but it will be on uh, issues related to the correctional system, uh, issues related to parole and pardons process, uh, and also issues on reentry uh, housing that's utilized by existing Department of Corrections Services uh, and those. Uh, those statutes that, uh, that relate to post-release supervision. So that is, that's the 22nd, um, the, the judi just not to be confused, the judiciary, uh, our committee, I'm vice chair of judiciary is also um, holding a hearing. These are interim studies. So um, on the 15th, the Thursday before that, and that one is regarding uh, police and community relations. So um, just so people aren't confused, there are two, one, one week after, one week before the other. So again, those are, the first one is community policing and, um, and then there will be another one in uh, uh, November, which will deal with juvenile issues. Uh, I think uh, uh, including juvenile life without parole and other issues regarding uh, right to counsel and representation of, of juveniles. So that's all coming up as well. Awesome, thank you. And um, also in the chat, um, you said you have all the information on this on these hearings in, in your office, and that anyone who would like to attend or watch uh, may call the office for more information. It's 402-471-2633. And um, about those hearings, Will, will they be allowing uh, testimony virtually or do you have to go there? 
That is a really good question. I have not heard yet, so I will, uh, I don't know, but that is something that if, if people are interested in testifying, please call. I, I believe that they will be having, yes, I do believe they will be having live testimony. So it may be that people are out in the hall and spaced out, uh, depending on, so sure. I do believe it will be live because on the, on the policing one, I have an interim study on that and, um, they will be, uh, we are having live testifiers. Yes, I have so. spoken, I've spoken to Zach, Dr. or Senator Lathrop's aide, and it yes. will, there will be live, there will be live testimony and written testimony, but not yes. virtual. Okay. Um, you can watch it, um, and they're encouraging right. people who, just ordinarily come to watch, to stay home and watch it on our screens um, so that, and they would like as many people as possible um, who have experienced issues in the system, re-entrance and families and so on, um, who could speak. And there will be, I mean, some people will be asked to testify. Uh, Director Frakes will be there at some point. Um, but most people will be restri restricted probably to three minutes, sometimes five. It, you know, seems to vary on how many people are there. Yes. So, thank awesome. you, Mary. Good. Yeah, thank you for sharing that information and uh, letting us, uh, you know, get that information out. Um, I see that we're just a few minutes away from the top of the hour, um, and I imagine at least a couple of you probably need to hop off. So before we do that, I just want to um, go over a couple of really brief uh, housekeeping things. Um, uh, first of all, yes, this, this, this whole session has been recorded, and um, it, it'll be shareable on, on social media, and you know, maybe you can pop some popcorn and have some friends watch it, um, whatever. Um, Second, uh, this is this is the most uncomfortable part for me. Nobody ever likes asking for money, but I'm going to take this opportunity to point out that NEDP, Amnesty International, and Racial Justice Coalition are all nonprofit organizations, uh, which means we're only able to do what we do because of the support we get from the public. Um, so, if you've enjoyed our discussion today and you'd like to become a partner in the mission of our organizations, um, I invite you to provide financial support as you are able. Um, there are donation buttons on our websites and we will make sure we get those websites in the chat um, and attached to whatever um, social media outlets this video ends up on. Um, if you're in a position where you find yourself unable to give of your resources, I would still invite you to reach out to any of our organizations directly to talk about opportunities to give of your time in the form of direct action, whether that's writing letters to the editor, making phone calls, offering to testify on legislative committee hearings, uh, helping with direct mail, or even just talking to your friends, family, and neighbors about these important issues. Uh, so, so reach out to us. We'd love to provide you with whatever support we can. You can contact Nebraskans for alternatives to the death penalty by shooting an email to info at nadp.net, or you can contact me directly. It's alex at nadp.net. And I, as we, as we close out, I would invite the rest of you to um, share websites and um, contact information and, and specific um, calls to action. So uh, have at it, uh, Megan and John A, if you'd like to jump in here. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, if y'all would like to keep up to date with us, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We try very hard to utilize those platforms as much as it's hard to always be putting out information and content, but um, we are active on those platforms. Um, we did tweet out today that uh, you can sign up for our newsletter where we send out updates, um, and I can include that link for the sign-up form uh, in the chat as well. But all of our legislative material ends up on our website, so we have our fact sheet for Nebraska on our website. Um, we even have our white paper and our fact sheet for Texas on our, on our website as well. If you're interested in, as, you know, things progress in Texas, um, we do have both of those resources on there for you. And then, um, yeah, Johnny and I can put our email addresses um, in the chat. 
if need be, if anyone wants any follow-up information, um, if we can provide any studies um, that we've been interacting with as we put together our Nebraska white paper. So, um, so yeah, Johnny, would you like to add anything? Sorry, I was typing. Um, we're always looking for volunteers as well. So even if, you know, um, I just grad, I just took the bar exam, so don't have a lot of money over here. So if that's you, you know, if you still want to help out or reach out or even just, I think it's important to want to educate yourself um, and just stay up to speed on everything that's going on in the world and in Nebraska. I think it's very important for everyone. And I'd like to jump in a little bit. I put uh, an address for Amnesty International on the chat. Um, on that page, you can, you can read some of what we're doing right now. There are a couple of actions that you can take, uh, participate in. And then you can also look at the 20, yeah, 2019 um, international facts about amnesty because we work in all of the countries that, that, uh, that have the death penalty. So, yeah. And, and uh, good luck on that bar exam. Uh, that's very exciting and, and I'm amazed how, how alert and ready to go you are today after that traumatic experience. Traumatic's the right word, yeah. <laughs> push, we just want to push through, that's, that's what that was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. And finally, as we have uh, hit the top of the hour, um, I would invite uh, Senator Pansy Brooks to offer any closing comments if she would like. Well, uh, I'm just, I'm so pleased to see Megan and Janae uh, working on these areas. We need uh, the next generation uh, excited and working and it's such a, it is really a blessing. And, and thanks to all of these people, Christy and Mary and Jean, everybody that has done so much work for literally decades and uh, way before I became involved very publicly. And uh, really, I, I hope we all realize the work that needs to be done. I, I really like that you're coming to Nebraska. Um, we are an easier state to move than most others. And uh, we, it, I believe that's true because if you think of it, we only have 49 state senators. And every other state has hundreds of representatives and senators. And you already probably have at least 20 of us right in your, in, in your pocket. So that means you have to convince about 10 to 15 people. Well, that's, that's not a lot when you think about that. That is, um, and you know, HRC, the Human Rights um, uh, Commission came it's not commission, sorry, coalition, came to Nebraska one of my first years. And, you know, I, I keep saying that, that, yeah, we're a small state, but we're a red state. And when, when we move, just like we moved on the death penalty that first time in 2015, it makes a statement. It's one of 50 states. And you only have to work to get 10 to 15 of us, not hundreds. So really, um, I, I keep saying that these national groups should really be uh, working in Nebraska and realizing that we are a state where dollars should be spent and minds change. So thank you for caring about us. Uh, thank you for your energy. We need your youth and your vision and your leadership. And uh, I, I'm just so excited. I'm, a, I'm grateful for, look, look at the generations here that we have, those that have given so much of their lives to this important issue, to care for others, to care for people who are vulnerable. And then the new groups that are coming up. And really, I, get, I have goosebumps looking at this, this group. Thank you. We should all remember to get out there to vote. I can't say that enough. Um, and just work to continue to make a difference. Don't be discouraged. Keep at it. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here today. This, uh, this went better than I could have hoped. And uh, I'm glad you're able to participate. And Wow. Yeah, thanks. Great job, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> Thank thanks, you. Alex. Thank you. <laughs>